Good morning and welcome to the Zoom event uh, Europe after Brexit, uh, UK after EU, organized by the European Parliament Liaison Office here in Croatia. My name is Dragan Nikolic and I'm going to be your host in the next 75 minutes uh, uh, here in Europe House in uh, Zagreb. The EU-UK trade uh, and uh, cooperation agreement is conditionally applied from 1st of January this year. The full entry into force of the agreement requires the consent of the European Parliament as negotiations uh, on the future relationship were concluded uh, only before the end of the transitional period and the agreement was signed on 30th of uh, December last year. The European Parliament's uh, democratic scrutiny process has uh, not yet uh, been completed. Members of parliamentary committees are currently reviewing uh, and considering the text before uh, voting in a plenary session in which the accompanying resolution as well uh, will be adopted. The agreement reached allows for free trades without quotas uh, and customs duties for goods uh, complying with the rules of origin, cooperation in a number of sectoral areas uh, of mutual interest, uh, judicial and institutional cooperation, and ways uh, to resolve the possible disputes. But the most important uh, question in this moment is the following one, does all that functions and works uh, these days in the everyday life? On the political, economic and social consequences of Brexit, the new EU-UK relationship, we are going to discuss today with our distinguished guests. In Brussels, uh, there should be Tonino Pizzula, member of the European Parliament, uh, representing group uh, of the Progressive Alliance of Socialists and Democrats, member of Committee on Foreign Affairs. Uh, good morning, Mr. Pizzula. I warmly welcome His Excellency Andrew Dalglish, UK Ambassador in Croatia. Good morning to you, sir, as well. Good morning. Then we send greetings to Italy, to Bologna, where currently Lucia Quaglia lives. After many years spent in the UK, professor and lecturer at the universities of Limerick, Sussex, Bristol, York, and nowadays Bologna, expert for the financial markets. Buongiorno, good morning, Lucia. Good morning, everyone. In London, it's always a great pleasure to see Quentin Peel, Associate Fellow with the Europe Programme at Chatham House in his fruitful journalistic career, among other important positions, from 76 till 94, Brussels correspondent of FT and Bureau Chief there. He was also a foreign editor and international affairs editor of Financial Times from 1994 until 2010, and finally Chief Correspondent in Berlin until 2013. A very good morning to you, Quentin, as well. Thank you for joining us. Good morning. And last but not the least, uh, I welcome Ms. Heidi Chenan, one of the top STEM experts in Croatia, co-founder and CEO of the artificial intelligence company Ertz, with plenty of international business experience, including the one in the UK. Good morning, good morning to you as well. Good morning. We are live streaming on the YouTube channel of the Croatian Radio Television uh, and the one of the EP liaison office in Croatia uh, as well. On the beginning of our discussion, uh, due to the fact that Mr. Pizzola needs to go uh, shortly after we start our session, because I would just remind you that these days it's quite uh, busy in Brussels, it's the Green Week, uh, we would discuss with him uh, and uh, share some of his thoughts. I hope with the others uh, you will not object. Uh, so therefore we start uh, with uh, Mr. Pizzola. Uh, from your perspective, sir, uh, what will be the long-term impact uh, of Brexit both for the EU and the UK on the long run? Should we say that we would see weakening positions of uh, UK and EU as the alliance or not? Thank you for inviting me. Uh, of course, uh, uh, as you said, it's a pretty busy week uh, here in the Brussels, especially it's a hectic Friday for me. But uh, I would like to say a couple uh, words generally on the Brexit before I directly answer your question. But first of all, I would like to greet His Excellency Ambassador, as well as other esteemed panelists, as well as other viewers. Uh, First of all, thank you for giving uh, me an invitation for some introductory remarks uh, at today's panel or topic, Europe after Brexit and the UK after EU. Um, so 
uh, what type of deal uh, did the UK and EU finally get from an uh, agreement signed at the last hours of Christmas Eve 2012? After a turbulent year, the new 2021st brought us the end of the transition period and a reality check with a long track queues and custom formalities. It was the path chosen by the UK and I once again regret that both of our citizens are paying the highest price. UK has been a member of the European Union for 47 years, helping the development of our union, despite conflicting positions on some issues. Make no mistake, we were stronger together. Instead, uh, we are reached a deal either side can't be truly happy with. But with the EU holding its ground, it's managed to give limited number of concessions to the UK based on its unwillingness to reciprocate on key issues such as a free movement of goods, services and people. European Parliament has insisted uh, throughout the negotiations on several priorities, such as rights of EU citizens, respecting Good Friday Agreement, preserving its uh, internal market, customs and particularities related to it. We have also insisted on securing and protecting our workers, our industry and our established practices. The UK is today is a third country trading with the EU outside the European single market and custom union. The trade and cooperation agreement therefore secures tariff-free trade of certain goods, but it still disrupts trade on grand scale. Many companies in the UK are facing devastating export stuff, increased cost and delays that deem trade unviable. Many UK businesses are open to EU subsidiaries or have already moved production or key offices to mainland European Union. Trade in services has been brought close to a halt due to the lack of the free movement of the people and the regulatory alignment. A deal on financial services seems not to be on the horizon due to vested interest of more than a few EU members. And the EU has already gained more than 6 billion euros to its market on London city's expense. Immediate result, the volume of exports going through Brits, British ports uh, to the European Union fell by a staggering 68 percentage last month compared to the January last year mostly as a result of problems caused by Brexit, as published by the Observer, based on information obtained from the Royal College Association. As everything on social media comes with a hashtag, one of the most popular concerning Brexit in the past couple of months is the hashtag taking back control, where people post all the unkept promises the Brexiteers gave to the UK public during the campaign. This UK government, that so vehemently campaigned for Brexit admits itself the net negative impact of the UK GDP to around 5% in the next 15 years. Businesses are not facing minor adjustment, but major structural changes. And with the current political climate in UK, sadly, I don't see any renegoti renegotiation of the deal anytime soon. For the EU, the CA, we mostly like negatively impact EU companies that trade with the UK or um, and rely on integrated supply chains involving the UK. However, much larger European single market also allows these companies to divert economic activity away from the UK. Most of us know how we got here, and I myself have been more than sad to see my UK MAPS colleagues leave European Parliament. But here we are. While the deal reached is the basis for the future relations, so are our shared past and culture in the past 45 years and long before that. As the TCA is due to be reviewed, every five years one can expect the negotiations to be set to the tune of UK general elections and European Union Parliament elections, with hope of the COVID crisis long behind us. Moving on from the economy, security and the international order are still to quite broad areas where I believe UK and EU have a, a lot of common ground to stand. 
We still share interest in our common struggle against climate change, European neighborhood, where we both desire stability and peace and uh, relations toward China and Russia. With our common transatlantic partnership with the US, a complete, completely different ballgame. What we must expect is that outside of the common EU framework, cooperation and even identifying shared goals will be more challenging, putting into question the real possibility of resolving disagreements in our aforementioned common goals and interests. As there is no mechanism to resolve these disputes, we should be able to interact within a continued dialogue. This is something we haven't been able to achieve during past years, unfortunately not during the Brexit negotiations, not in relation to resolving the trade disputes with China or the access of the companies to our markets concerning security issues. Let's hope that the upcoming UN climate conference of the US re-entered the Paris climate agreement and the EU adopted its Green Deal will give us opportunity to cooperate on achieving concrete goals we've already agreed upon. With the change of government in the US, there was certainly a shift in expectations of the near future US relations. We cannot anymore expect the UK to automatically side with the US on all issues that might arise. This comes in the light of President Biden's announced new policy towards the European Union. And direct answer to your question, about <clears throat> long-term global political impact of Brexit, both uh, for the EU and the UK. Um, I would uh, answer as a unique and the most important uh, political project in European history, European Union must renew its global role in the turbulent first decades of the 21st century. Unlike its geopolitical rivals, European Union is a not common state but community of states, which makes it difficult for the EU to function in a global crisis of multilateralism. Let me remind you that the EU has lost important benefits from the UK permanent seat on the UN Security Council as their security, defense and diplomatic competencies. It's also cost of nuclear power, with France remaining the only nuclear power in the European Union and with the Brexit, the only in the EU to have extensive military capacities. I would like to see European Union in the first half of the 21st century more smart than soft power. Let's hope that UK will find its proper place in the future, but we must be aware about one thing. For example, China's view on, uh, on the West and uh, China's views on the European Union uh, is that, that uh, they are perceiving us more and more under the Xi Jinping president as a global swing state, and they are trying to decouple, for example, in the years to come, uh, US from its allies. But Brexit is a nice example that the decoupling is uh, underway. <clears throat> because European Union and the uh, United Kingdom, they are not under the same hub like it was half a century. Thank you. Mr. Pizzola, thank you very much for uh, those uh, introductory, quite interesting remarks. I would just uh, use this opportunity to ask you about a very recent event uh, uh, related to post-Brexit uh, uh, process. Uh, what do you think, how much uh, EC's decision to attempt to stop COVID-19 vaccines made in the EU arriving in Northern Ireland in a bid to prevent uh, the region becoming a backdoor for jabs to be sent to Great Britain has damaged the post-Brexit process. I agree with you. I think it was a uh, <clears throat> not necessary move uh, done in a hurry and uh, uh, I regret for that. And but I was, uh, I was pleased that the Commission uh, admitted its mistake and withdrew that decision. Anything uh, which might hurt uh, our relations uh, is, is absolutely uh, not welcome uh, because the, our agreement um, broadly uh, settles how EU and UK will uh, trade goods with each other in, in the future. However, uh, the same cannot be said for their uh, future political relations. The last of trust over the last four years, coupled with the Brexit project, 
ideological in nature, will continue to cause frictions, potentially putting the whole uh, arrangement into the question. So such uh, uh, moves that didn't help in that sense. You are one of the most experienced European parliamentarians dealing with foreign policy, former Minister of Foreign Affairs as well. What's your perspective? Um, a major part uh, of the reasoning behind Brexit from the UK side was to provide more flexibility uh, in signing international trade deals. Will this be a likely long-term outcome? And in that regard, uh, what is your perception of the future UK-US uh, relationship with Biden transition? Would that be more beneficial or detrimental to it? It's very hard to say because Mr. Biden is uh, announcing completely different foreign policy strategy, of course, trying to bring back United States in a multilateral arena uh, with the Paris Climate Agreement. And uh, <clears throat> this morning, of course, it was announced that the uh, US will uh, renegotiate the nuclear deal with the Iran. So uh, we must be absolutely aware that uh, we are moving through uncharted territory. And I do believe that the uh, UK, European Union, and especially United States of America will fight again for the basic values uh, our uh, countries or associations uh, were built upon it. Otherwise, we will open an area and uh, allow uh, the other um, illiberal, non-democratic uh, players on uh, in international arena, not only to put foot on the door, but to enter the space uh, where they can, of course, damage uh, uh, our relations and jeopardize our interest as a families of democracies. Future relationship between uh, UK and USA. We know Mr. Biden not just once uh, described Mr. Johnson as a physical and emotional clone of Donald Trump. Could we expect economic or political alliance between uh, two countries? What's your perspective? Yeah, Biden's even uh, through his campaign and, and before warned very, very clearly uh, London that uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, moving away from the European Union is not something which uh, capital uh, uh, was welcoming in a way. So now they they need to set a scene for the next uh, generation of the relations between Washington and the London. Um, one thing is for sure, it's impossible to uh, bring back uh, 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 circumstances uh, 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 valid in 2016 when Donald Trump arrived on the scene. So I think it's a lot of work uh, from both sides of Atlantic, Biden administration and uh, uh, Boris Johnson uh, government to reestablish, uh, first of all, some kind of the trust, because we all know that Donald Trump was pretty passionate about Brexit. And uh, I think uh, if you want to... Um, uh, generally speaking, strengthened position of the West. We need uh, not to put a blind eye on what had happened in the past, but we need to find a common ground, especially because uh, there is a lot of common denominators. We can um, uh, regain trust, as I said, uh, fighting against the climate changes and the fighting against all kinds of the uh, security threat, because I think it's very uh, important to put that into the focus of them planning future relations. Mr. Pizzola, thank you very much for your participation and your time, uh, and uh, hope to see you soon in some of our sessions uh, in the future. Thank you. Your Excellency Dalglish, you have heard Mr. Pizzola uh, from Brussels. Uh, Please, if you have uh, remarks regarding his positions or thoughts, uh, you share it with us. If not, I would as well ask you uh, a question, first of all, related to health, public health issues. Uh, we know what happened uh, with that move of uh, European Commission and the uh, COVID-19 vaccine program. Uh, what was, from your point of view, a UK-EU agreement on facilitating supplies of medical products when negotiations uh, were done? Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Nikolic, and thank you, Mr. Pizzola. You covered a lot of ground there. Um, much of what Mr. Pizzola said, uh, I'm able to agree with. Um, much of what he said, I don't agree with as well. Um, uh, like? Start with the United States, for example. Um, we have never been in a situation where we have 
simply um, automatically sided with the United States. Um, that's not British foreign policy. Um, and when we disagree, then we stand up and, and we say so, uh, as we have done numerous times in, in previous years. Um, so none of that changes the fact that um, there is a very, very strong relationship between the UK and the US um, that, that overrides personalities. Um, and whatever Mr. Johnson had said about Mr. Trump and Mr. Biden had said about Mr. Johnson, we still managed to get on really rather well. Uh, and yes, it does take hard work because we've got a lot of respect for each other, um, but it does tend to work. Um, yes, the United States, in the form of Mr. Biden, regretted the UK's departure from the European Union, um, but it's accepted it and it moves on and we look at the future. Uh, and that's how our relationship is uh, characterised. When it comes to foreign policy, um, uh, I agree with what Mr Pitzola said. The European Union has found it traditionally rather difficult to form a um, firm, uh, meaningful foreign policy that bites, that has effect. Uh, we see this again and again in the slowness uh, or indeed the inability to agree sanctions, for example, to take firm actions. Uh, that's something that the UK is now able to do uh, much more swiftly um, as a result of being in control of its, uh, its own ability to do that. So, yes, there are things that have changed. Some of them are producing short term negative impacts. But the longer term, um, there are other opportunities. It's up to us to take advantage of what those opportunities uh, are. Uh, but to try to judge after um, barely two months out of the European Union whether Brexit was a good idea or not uh, seems to be rather heroic. Um, I think we need to give it a little bit more time. Uh, moving to your question about um, medical uh, equipment. Um, uh, the Article 16 decision, as, as Mr. Pitzola says, was regrettable, um, uh, not uh, because it uh, had an impact on the flow of vaccines, but because of trust. Um, in the negotiation, Mr. Pitzola talked about um, the, the, the difficulties surrounding trust and confidence in each other. We were told repeatedly by the European Union that um, the number one priority when it came to that uh, situation between Northern Ireland and Ireland uh, and the relationship, the number one priority was protection of the Belfast Good Friday Agreement. And 30 days uh, after the negotiations uh, were signed off, um, that was suddenly shown not to be the case, um, that public health um, or internal market or whatever you want to call it mattered more. That was the perception seen in Belfast. Uh, and seen in London. So the damage to, to trust um, is something that we'll need to work on to rebuild. Um, it is good that the Commission changed its mind um, and we now have to start building that trust. But in terms of uh, movement of medical equipment, um, that is part of the, the, the deal, um, that there should be no limits, there should be no tariffs, there should be no obstacles. Uh, to medical equipment moving around. Indeed, that we've got recognition of good manufacturing practice inspections to facilitate it, um, because at the end of the day, it's about protecting citizens and it's about protecting public health, and that's in both our interests. Uh, Your Excellency, the UK uh, currently eyes a new trading club, uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership, uh, or abbreviation is uh, CPTPP. We know that the project of Global Great Britain that PM Johnson as well has mentioned quite a number of times, implies conclusion of free trade uh, agreements around the world. But except that one that I've mentioned and the one with Japan, are there any others on the horizons or not? Yes, there are. Okay. Uh, the, the, the objective is to have 80% of the value of our total trade covered by trade agreements uh, within three years of leaving Brexit. Uh, is that realistic? Is that realistic to expect? At the moment, we've got 64% covered. That's not bad, uh, I think, um, given the objective. Um, we have a deal with uh, Japan, with Singapore, with Israel, um, with uh, uh, Switzerland, with Turkey, with Norway. There's a list of 64 countries or trading blocks um, where deals have been um, either agreed, signed in principle, or indeed ratified. So we're making good progress there. And this, in a way, is the point um, that there is a world outside the European Union. It doesn't mean we disrespect the European Union or we don't value it. Um, but looking at who we will need to do business with in the future, uh, the borders need to be beyond that of the European Union. And now that we're not in the customs union, we are free to be able to make those kinds of deals.
Uh, Lucia, the UK financial services sector is nearly 100 times more economically important than fishing. And we know what happened with fishing as one of the most disputed uh, issues uh, in the negotiations and pays a whooping 11% of all taxes. However, it was almost uh, totally ignored in the Brexit negotiations. Why is that so? Why the voice of the city of London has not been so much heard uh, in, in that regard? And what were the main topics regarding uh, financial services during the negotiations? Okay, that's, that's very interesting because in the past, uh, the city of London, the UK financial sector has been quite influential in shaping UK uh, public policy. So it's quite surprising also from a political point of view, why this was not the case during the Brexit negotiation. And I would say there are three main factors that account for this. The first one is that the city uh, of London, so the uh, UK financial sector itself, was somewhat divided on this issue. Uh, the vast majority of the city was against Brexit and then in favor of uh, uh, the softer form of Brexit possible. Uh, but then there were also some financial services. I'm thinking about, for example, hedge funds uh, that are actually uh, quite in favor of Brexit. So uh, a division within the city. Second point is the, uh, an institutional explanation is that uh, in the past there was a very good connection is called in the literature to so the nexus between the city of London, uh, the Bank of England and uh, the Treasury. And this was a nexus through which the city concern priorities were in a way channeled through to Whitehall, the, the central government. In the case of Brexit, there were two institutional changes that were made in the UK. The first one that was the setting up of a ministry for exiting the European Union and the second one was the setting up of a trade ministry. Uh, and these two new ministries were in charge of dealing of the Brexit negotiation and therefore also the part of financial services. And the city of London, the financial services sector in the UK had actually much less well-established channel to do these two ministries. And I'm also told by the financial sector there was some problem accesses and getting uh, the city concerns through to uh, uh, to officials and, in, and ministers in those two institutions. And then the third reason is that uh, Brexit is ha has high political salience, uh, is very much a politicized issue. And in the past, uh, the financial industry has been better able to exert its influence uh, on issues which are insulated uh, from public scrutiny, um, from the purview of public opinion. And I think that's a, a fair comment also for financial sector in general, not only in the UK. Uh, whereas in the case of Brexit, the Brexit negotiation on finance were embedded into the broader negotiation on Brexit. So there was a lot of public attention, it was politically salient, and therefore uh, the city of London, the financial industry in the UK was actually less able to get its preferences taken on board during the negotiation by the uh, UK authorities. Uh, let's go now for it, uh, a bit uh, more north to London. Quentin, how does uh, life in post-Brexit Britain looks like these days? Uh, we know that UK is a European champion in the vaccination program. Uh, yes, uh, it, it, it has done well on the vaccination front. It hasn't done well on most of the rest of dealing with COVID. Unfortunately, we have a... Uh, relatively were well, one of the highest death rates from COVID and also one of the uh, biggest uh, recessions in the economy uh, in the in the G7 uh, and indeed in comparison with other members of the European Union. But that we have done well on vaccination, I think partly because uh, the government has been able to concentrate overwhelmingly on that subject and to get it working. So from that point of view, I think it's uh, th there's a feeling here, well, we're fine, we're better off with Brexit. We're living though in a sort of very curiously unreal world where the huge change that Brexit means to our economy, our trade relations and so on, has been pushed completely uh, off the front pages and to one side by dealing with the pandemic. And the problems that I think Brexit is inevitably causing at the frontiers, in our trade and so on, are 
much less because the entire economy has slowed down dramatically uh, because of COVID. So we're in this curious world where we're hit by a double whammy, the pandemic on one side and Brexit on the other. But the uh, causes and consequences of the slowdown are really deeply confused that the problems uh, associated with Brexit are being really hidden by the overwhelming economic effect of the pandemic. But was that the case as well uh, in the final stage of the Brexit negotiations as well? Corona crisis as a kind of uh, fig leaf to, to cover up uh, as such? Yes, I think that that's absolutely fair. I think that uh, everybody got um, exhausted by the process of Brexit, uh, tragically, really. So what we were just talking about, Lucia was talking about the financial services sector. I mean, the financial services sector was effectively excluded almost entirely from the negotiations, which was insane. I mean, it's, it's really going to be a problem now to get financial services Uh, anywhere back, anywhere near uh, the contribution that they were making, both in the EU and in London, uh, because they were simply excluded from the package. So it's the highest priority. But because the whole thing was really rushed through to an artificial deadline, uh, an awful lot of things have been excluded, which only now are going to be the subject of very long lasting negotiations, which I suspect the next five to 10 years uh, of Britain's relationships with the EU will be devoted to actually still putting all the pieces back together again. In that regard, it's quite interesting to see that uh, Prime Minister Johnson uh, has announced and has drafted former British negotiator, uh, Lord Frost into his cabinet. It's an extraordinary situation. We thought that uh, Michael Gove, the, the sort of key minister in the cabinet, was going to be in charge of relations with the EU. He'd done all the negotiations and suddenly we have Lord Frost coming back into the equation and being promoted into the cabinet. One of the problems with the British side of the negotiations on Brexit has been that divisions within the British government have been constant. The British government, right from the start of these negotiations under Theresa May, and then under Boris Johnson, has been quite deeply divided within itself, both in terms of its tactics, in terms of long-term goals. Did we want a hard Brexit or a soft Brexit? Well, with Lord Frost coming back into the equation, this is a man who very much dictated the strategy of the final negotiations, who clearly is a, a man who knows the detail, but he's seen very much, I think both in Brussels and in London, as a hardliner. He's somebody who was absolutely adamant that the question of British sovereignty must come above the question of market access for British manufacturers, British financial services, and so on. So market access came second, sovereignty came first, and by putting him back in charge of the relationship, it looks as if it's going to be a fairly hard-nosed British government conducting those negotiations. We've got one classic example at the moment, which um, is an extraordinarily unnecessary aggravation of the relationship with the UK government refusing to give full diplomatic status to the EU ambassador in London, which is already causing problems in terms of communication. And it's the sort of, if you like, unnecessary uh, finger wagging uh, that I fear is going to bedevil this relationship for many months to come. Ambassador Dalglish, let's go back to the Northern Ireland Protocol. We all know why it's there and what does it represent. Uh, but, you know, could you share with us perhaps some of your feedbacks uh, from, from your country? How does that work in everyday life? Could you give us some examples? We know for many delays, for problems with uh, customs declarations, for uh, losses of businesses. 
Uh, yeah, as predicted, um, it's going to be a while before the system is, is running as smoothly as everybody would like, that's for sure. Uh, no surprises there. Um, the, the point of the protocol is to make sure that um, there is no hard border between Northern Ireland and Ireland. That's one important element of the um, Belfast Good Friday Agreement. Another important element of the Belfast Good Friday Agreement, which is as equally important, uh, is that there is um, uh, no separation between Northern Ireland and Great Britain, that it remains part of the uh, UK's customs uh, union uh, as well. So how do you reconcile the two? It was always going to be uh, a tricky issue. Um, so yes, we have seen some uh, delays. We have seen some problems of uh, processes of getting things through. Some of the approvals processes were there before Brexit, let's not forget, um, because of the specific epidemiological requirements around um, uh, sanitary and phytosanitary requirements of products being taken into onto the island of Ireland. Um, so Brexit hasn't brought, brought those about, they were always there in the first place. Um, but we have in place a trader support service um, which is designed to help traders uh, go from end to end in the process of getting their goods uh, to and from um, uh, with 200 million pounds of, of government backing to do that. It's not going to be a solution overnight. This is why the government has stressed it's really important that we continue talking about this Northern Ireland protocol to make sure that it's respected and that it works. But uh, as you said, there are uh, problems and they should have been expected. But is it, for instance, true that you really need, uh, what, 71 pages of paperwork for lorry of fish to export to the EU? Uh, UK meat producers are saying and claiming that what used to take them 15 minutes, uh, uh, now it's three or four hours on average for one particular load. How your government is coping with, with that? It's for sure that um, if you leave the customs union, then you have to work according to different rules. That, that's um, absolutely clear. Um, I think uh, some of the uh, exporters um, uh, were on the belief that um, they'd just carry on as normal. If, if a deal is done, then nothing changes. That's not true. That's what we're seeing now. Uh, and yes, indeed, um, those forms need to be filled out. Compliance needs to be shown, uh, particularly when it comes to things like um, live animal uh, exports, um, fish, um, the uh, rules uh, that are in place that we respect that you have to um, comply with for getting into the European Union market are significant uh, and require a lot of certification. Uh, and again, uh, the government is working very hard to make sure that uh, exporters understand what the rules are, are able to comply as quickly uh, as possible. We are seeing uh, difficulties. Um, that's, uh, there's, there's no denying that that's, uh, that's the case. Um, but we will overcome those difficulties. We're still very, very early days. Uh, UK government says that the trade agreement with the EU reflects uh, uh, the UK's new status as an independent uh, coastal state and protects and promotes uh, the rights of fishermen across the UK. But why then there are so many complaints from exactly fishermen, especially from Scotland and Wales. Does that mean that really, as some analysts have said in the final stages of negotiations, uh, it was lost for UK when it comes to the fishing? I don't think so, because those fishermen are seeing in the first year of the deal that was done, we have a five and a half year transition period uh, before we move to, to allow uh, everybody to, to adapt, uh, before we take um, absolute complete control over all our uh, fishing waters. Um, and in that first year, quotas have increased 15% uh, for uh, British fish fishermen. So they will be seeing a, a growth in, in what they can catch. It doesn't mean they can go and catch anything. You know, the UK is one of the world's leaders when it comes to um, protecting the environment. Um, and that means keeping our oceans and seas healthy. And that means managing our fish stocks. Um, so people who are expecting leaving the European Union means you can go out and catch whatever you want are going to be disappointed. Um, but as you said yourself, Mr. Nikolic, uh, 71 pages of customs form um, is not something that anybody would welcome. Uh, and there will be some frustrations until we manage to streamline those processes. Uh, Quentin, uh, fisheries which contributes uh, only 0.12% of GDP to the British economy threatened to sink the overall trade agreement uh, worth billions of, of euros. Uh, somehow it has become a symbol of restored sovereignty and in coastal communities which have largely voted for Brexit, expectations have been created uh, about the post-Brexit time. Now those people are saying that uh, Mr. Johnson has betrayed them. 
Yes, particularly in Scotland, where I think uh, the increased quotas that the ambassador referred to uh, have made very little difference. In fact, they've seen that uh, their quotas have barely increased at all. I mean, fisheries was one of the great hypocrisies of these entire negotiations. They were turned into a huge political issue by those fighting for Brexit, totally ignoring the fact that the far most important aspect of British fisheries was the sales to the continent of uh, shellfish and other fish, and that the uh, numbers employed in the actual fishing industry were very small. That was one uh, madness that we were actually going to endanger our sales of fish to the continent in order to be allowed to fish a bit more uh, in our own waters. But having said that, the, uh, uh, the, the, really the, the other problem was, I think, that basically the fishing sector were lied to, that their lives were going to be transformed. The British have, for a long time, actually had given far more of their quota away to the huge factory ships and trawlers rather than the little inshore boats of the local fishermen. And they were never going to get anything decent out of this deal. So it's a real tragedy for that, uh, for the fishing industry. I don't think that there's going to be any significant benefit to them at all from this whole process. Um, and they feel as betrayed as anybody. Uh, let's go a bit uh, uh, back to the financial markets and business. Uh, Lucia, is there still a desire for widespread deregulation uh, to create what some, including uh, Prime Minister Johnson, have styled a Singapore uh, on Thames? And should UK financial uh, services industry focus on competing with the US and Asia, meaning uh, New York and Singapore, or with Europe, uh, EDES, Berlin and Paris? So let me start by saying that the UK-European Union trade agreement has minimal provisions on financial services, about 10 articles or so. So on the one hand, uh, generally speaking, trade agreements have a limited provision of financial services, but the one between the UK and the European Union has really, really minimal provision. So the main way in which the UK financial industry, financial entities, uh, and uh, financial activities can be actually uh, exported, if you want, to the continent, is by using the so-called equivalence provision. So there was the loss of the passporting mechanism, not the passport uh, as for individuals, but was the ability to uh, basically for a financial service provider to provide services across the European Union on the basis of the authorization of the home authorities. So this was very important because basically a financial uh, services providers based in the UK were able then to export their financial services across the European Union. So that has gone as a result of Brexit. So the main way to access the European Union is actually using the so-called equivalence clauses. And now without going into the technical details, uh, how does this answer uh, your question? Well, uh, as part of equivalence provision means that at least for the uh, financial services covered by specific equivalence provision, the UK government should retain regulatory alignment with the European Union means they cannot diverge too much. And if the UK government therefore decides to substantially diverge from European Union provision of certain financial services, the equivalence provision or decision will actually be abandoned. So it would be more difficult, more costly for UK financial services provider to get access to the European Union. So there is a trade-off for the UK government and the financial industry in the UK. Uh, the more they diverge from European Union financial rules, uh, the higher the risk of, uh, of losing a equivalence decision and therefore getting more costly access to the European Union market. Uh, Heidi, first of all, thank you very much for being uh, so patient. What was your experience um, of doing business in, in London? Uh, and with Brexit approaching, did you notice the change in the atmosphere when it comes to the business uh, regarding investments uh, and companies that have been established there? Yeah, hi. So, um, as we've heard from uh, other speakers, uh, obviously Brexit has a 
affected uh, different industries in different uh, ways, uh, since I'm mostly in the IT tech and startup uh, ecosystem. Uh, I have to say that, uh, as Mr. Um, Quentin said, uh, they've been more concerned and affected by the pandemics than by Brexit, uh, to be honest. And also um, with the process of Brexit, like, going on for such a long period of time, it was kind of interesting to see peaks and, and throws in um, um, worrying about it or not worrying it out about it, uh, how to prepare for it. So when I was in London in 2018, basically at that point, nobody was in our um, segment really talking about Brexit. And uh, because they probably didn't, we didn't feel that it's going to affect or this is going to happen anytime soon. So at that point of time, it was really not something that was much of a concern. Uh, but when it comes to startups, I also dare say it's a bit of a difference uh, on uh, those that are coming from abroad and establishing presence in the UK and those that were there. So, for example, for for um, any uh, Croatians that uh, are coming or are already there, since we're kind of um, used to a lot of uh, obstacles and hurdles uh, in businesses, you know, I dare say also Brexit was just one thing that's going to happen and that didn't really phase um, companies and doing business. Um, on the other hand, uh, there were two concerns I that I know that were kind of worrying tech sector. Um, and that is the data transfer data privacy privacy laws. So maybe GDPR, if I'm not mistaken, did originate in the UK, but you know, now with uh, the Brexit, there will be a lot of uh, regulations that need to be uh, aligned. So uh, a lot of companies, uh, kind of solve that problem by establishing EU subsidiaries or even moving the headquarters to some of the EU countries. Again, for the businesses that are coming from Croatia to the UK, um, we kind of already circumvented that problem because a lot of companies started off here and then opened uh, uh, headquarters in the UK. So we already have an EU presence. So again, from this perspective, that has not affected us that much. Uh, and the other issue was the financing, the sources of financing, because um, when you're a startup, uh, then, you know, sources of financing are very important. And with EU, there are a lot of um, funds and grants that can be uh, used and that can be applied for. So I know that, that there was a concern a lot with the businesses of um, whether they will have access to the EU grants uh, after Brexit. Some are still in place, but it's a question of how long that will, um, of course, still be in effect. Uh, on the other hand, the UK has great investment schemes that uh, we would also like to have, especially here in Croatia, such as SEIS and EIS. So there is a lot of sources of financing that's readily available in the UK itself. So. I don't know, to be honest, uh, when it comes to tech sector, it comes to, to startups, uh, they're, as I said, expecting hurdles and obstacles and they're very um, uh, flexible and are able to adapt rather quickly. So uh, I don't think uh, anyone has allowed really themselves to wait for what is going to happen. Everyone has reacted rather quickly uh, in order to prepare themselves to be able to continue business as usual, you know, even when the Brexit finally comes into place as it has. Uh, but Heidi, was... Heidi, thank thank you for now. We will uh, come back to you. Uh, I just wanted to ask uh, uh, Ambassador Dalglish, uh, one of the biggest uh, arguments for leaving the EU uh, is that it would allow the UK to set uh, its own immigration policy. Uh, those wishing to live and work um, in the UK now must gain 70 uh, points these days. Uh, we are talking pretty much about uh, perhaps Australian model of uh, immigration influx. Uh, 
Uh, is that just uh, a way to reduce the entry of unskilled uh, labor force to the UK? And do you see uh, changes of the UK's labor market already? Uh, yeah, I think that's right. Um, that the uh, one of the promises uh, made um, was that we would have a different um, immigration policy, uh, one that being a member of the European Union wouldn't allow us to have, at least within uh, the European Union, uh, because of the principle of free movement. Um, so that has been introduced as a uh, policy that applies to anybody coming from outside the UK uh, to work in, in, uh, in the UK. Um, it's far too soon, I think, to, to see whether we've uh, got a changing, um, we've already seen a change in our labour force. Um, we'll have to see what happens next. But the point is, yes, to be able to be uh, more in control of who we um, allow to come to work in the uh, United Kingdom. Um, like it or not, um, rightly or wrongly, that's what the policy objective was and that's what this policy is being delivered. But I think it's worth picking up um, points uh, hinted at by, uh, by uh, Ms Senan, um, that the UK remains a very desirable destination uh, when it comes to foreign direct investment, um, with uh, second largest um, uh, in terms of value in the European uh, zone, uh, and the largest in terms of number of projects. So there's still a great interest in coming to work in the UK. But as well, there is a fast track visa uh, system to keep the UK open for the talented scientists. That's right. Um, and uh, that, again, is about the flexibility that we now have over our own uh, immigration system to be able to take decisions like that. Uh, Quentin, let's go a bit back to uh, North Island Protocol. Uh, Cabinet Office Minister, Mr. Gov, as you have mentioned him, said an urgent reset was needed to the protocol governing checks on the uh, uh, trade between uh, Great Britain and uh, Northern Ireland. And unionists as well want uh, this protocol to be scrapped. They say it damages trade and places a border down the Irish Sea. Is uh, this protocol the only viable way to protect Good Friday Agreement? I think it is very important in trying to protect the Good Friday Agreement and that uh, although there is a lot of hostility to the protocol from the unionist side in Northern Ireland, I think that both uh, the British government, uh, Brussels and of course the Irish government have made it very clear that they think this has got to stay. Now, the problem is that um, Brexit fundamentally is a cause of greater intercommunal division in Northern Ireland after the Good Friday Agreement. That's to say it has brought alive again this division between unionists who are desperate to keep the closest possible relationship between Great Britain and Northern Ireland and nationalists who want uh, the closest possible relationship between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. And that, I think, is going to be a very live issue. We've seen the numbers of people who actually believe there ought to be uh, a referendum in Northern Ireland on the border, i.e. a referendum about the possible reunification of Ireland, creeping back to a majority, just around 50%. But it's, the trouble is it's made it a divisive issue uh, in the community. And I think holding things together in Northern Ireland is going to be more difficult. One of the, the two adjectives have been used to me many times when talking to people in Dublin about British government's attitudes to Northern Ireland. And those words are arrogance and ignorance. The tragedy of this whole debate was that the Irish question was ignored for far too long. When finally they tried to do a deal uh, where Theresa May said, OK, let's somehow try and keep the whole of the United Kingdom within the same sort of deal so that Northern Ireland isn't separated away. It was Boris Johnson and his supporters who brought down her government and brought her down as Prime Minister, to stop that happening. So now we've got the Northern Ireland Protocol, which is deeply disliked by the unionist community, but that's the best we've got. 
One other referendum, the one that Nicola Sturgeon again is announcing is a complete headache, I would say, for Mr. Johnson. We know that on the Brexit referendum, most of the Scots, majority of them were against uh, uh, leaving uh, the EU. Nowadays, what's the percentage for, for independence? And could Scotland as well uh, be one of the hotspots and uh, in sequence uh, one of uh, geopolitical spots uh, in post-Brexit time? Yes, I think that inevitably Brexit has aggravated the divisions within the United Kingdom between those who wanted to remain, a clear majority in Scotland, a clear majority in Northern Ireland, and those who wanted to leave who were primarily in England. So that's come back to haunt us again. In Scotland, if you remember, when they originally had their referendum on independence, it was a 55 to 45 vote to preserve the union. The polling figures now look more like 50, 51 um, to 48 in favour of independence. It's still very close, just indeed as the question is very close in Northern Ireland. The problem is that this has created uh, new divisions, and I think the, the real possibility that looking down the line, say, 10 years, we could see Scotland voting for independence, we could see Northern Ireland voting for reunification of Ireland, and poor little England and Wales will be an even smaller uh, country outside the European Union. Ambassador Dalglish, uh, if the Scottish nationalists uh, win the elections in uh, May this year, uh, is it likely that Westminster might soften uh, their stance and position regarding the new potential Scottish uh, referendum? Well, I'm not going to speculate on who might win elections and, and what they would do if they did. Um, uh, but looking back at the terms on which the, the initial referendum was agreed by um, Westminster and the powers to, to take the legal process to um, have a referendum in Edinburgh under the Edinburgh Agreements, that was back in 2012, I think. Um, the deal was, that was accepted on all sides, that this is the once-in-a-lifetime referendum. Um, and that was less than 10 years ago. So uh, whatever happens, um, I don't expect to see Westminster um, changing tack from that. But this is a democracy, this is politics, and we all know anything can happen within the rules. Let's go from the level of high politics a bit lower to the everyday life. Uh, uh, we know that the UK no longer uh, participates in Erasmus, uh, the EU, EU student exchange scheme. A British uh, uh, PM Johnson says it is too expensive, or he said that during the negotiations. Instead, British students uh, could participate in the World Exchange Scheme program known as Turing. Uh, what is the sentiment in uh, academic circles and among the youngsters uh, uh, regarding the implications of Brexit in, in that regard, high education and this exchange uh, that was quite beneficiary, I would say, for the British economy at the end of the day as well? I'll defer to Professor Qualia for um, a view on what, what the academic community is feeling like. Um, but I think the, the point to note here is that when it comes to value for money, um, Erasmus was a poor model for the UK. Uh, and if we're in uh, a world where we're taking back control and, and we're in, con in charge of our own taxpayers' money, um, then that's got to be a factor. So the Turing scheme is designed to offer more opportunity um, because it's a global scheme. Uh, it's designed to be more accessible uh, because it can reach out to those on vocational schemes, it can reach out to schools, those in further education rather than in, than in higher education. Erasmus certainly in the UK tended to favour the socially advantaged already rather than the socially less advantaged. We can make a change uh, for that with uh, Turing. Uh, so it's a change. I know people don't like change. It's different. Uh, but uh, we have different opportunities uh, available here. Um, and again, uh, we're two months in, so let's not be hasty in uh, forming judgments about whether people like it or not. Uh, Lucia, what's, what's your thought about that? You were lecturing for years in the UK. Uh, you have not lost contacts with universities, perhaps your uh, ex-students or people that now are working in the universities. Uh, was that in the best interests of UK to uh, go out of Erasmus? 
Well, I think it's a real pity that the UK government decided to pull out from the Erasmus scheme uh, because as an educator and an academic, I think it's a very rich experience from a personal point of view and also from an academic or professional point of view. I have actually the opportunity to experience Erasmus uh, Erasmus program on both sides. So I'm currently welcoming a lot of Erasmus students in my classes because all my courses at the University of Bologna are in English. So I really have a very large percentage of Erasmus students and are all uh, enthusiastic, at least the vast majority, about the Erasmus uh, experience. And they are also disappointed that the UK has decided to pull out from this program. I should also add, I experienced the Erasmus program also from the other side of the table. I was myself an Erasmus student in the UK back in 1994 at the University of Bradford. So that was my first, if you want, uh, uh, international experience. And at least from a personal point of view, was one of the most important turning points in my life. And I think it was an incredible experience. So... Uh, that, that, that's a shame that uh, a younger generation will not have this opportunity. Uh, Heidi, you are representing uh, the young generation as well, the business circles. Uh, perhaps what's your stand uh, uh, on, on this subject? And uh, in general, we have mentioned education and high education. Uh, what about the technology and innovation that already you have mentioned a bit? What do you think, what kind of consequences Brexit might have uh, on, on that sector? I did kind of mention that I don't see a lot of effects of, uh, of Brexit on that sector because uh, it's adaptable. And um, um, to be fair, uh, it is a question when it comes a bit to investments, whether there will be uh, any change, because at the moment there is a bit of a hesitancy of uh, funding startups in this sector that would like to open uh, headquarters in London. And that's at least our experience here in Croatia. Um, and they are more inclined to uh, suggesting against some other EU country. Uh, but that is mostly with EU-based uh, VC funds and investors. So we will see if that will change. As for the education part, uh, as uh, uh, Ms. Qualia said, uh, it is a shame that there is um, that the UK left Erasmus. I have not been, been part of that, but uh, I have had the opportunity to study abroad and really have that experience of uh, international environment and community. So um, with the EU, it was amazing that there was such an easy way of uh, exchanging students in, in various countries. And hopefully this will not uh, make it so much more difficult for anyone from the EU countries who want to go to study in the UK. Um, on the other hand, you know, today, especially with technology, the uh, education is available at the click of the mouse everywhere. So um, we, we have to see what will happen. And um, but definitely it will would be nice for the students to be able to go there in person and really experience that part of life because it is enriching. Uh, Heidi, thank you very much for your participation. We are approaching to the end of our session. Therefore, I will give uh, closing uh, words for the other participants. Um, Ambassador Douglish, what we could expect in months to come? Would that be uh, regarding POTS Brexit uh, uh, process uh, a year to remember or a year to forget? Uh, a year where lots of efforts, energy simultaneously with the COVID crisis would need to be invested? Yeah, I've given up trying to predict anything after the past 12 months. Uh, it's really not not a sensible game to get involved in. Uh, but I think um, that um, this is going to be a year of work. There's no doubt about it. Um, this is when we will be discovering um, which bits of the uh, agreement with the European Union work well, which bits need more uh, work uh, doing to them to make them work better. Um, what new opportunities and changes that we have to experience to uh, um, to take advantage of um, being outside the European Union. Um, and I think it'll be a year of coming to terms. Uh, I think a lot of the conversation uh, I've been hearing today, the discussion I've been hearing today has implied that 
once you've stopped being a part of an, a European Union process, you therefore disengage completely from that policy area, from that subject, uh, from that goal. Um, uh, that could be an outcome if we get it wrong, or we could say, OK, we're not involved in, for example, Erasmus anymore, but we do want European students to come and study in the UK, and we do want British students uh, to go around the world. And uh, I have to make a disclosure, I was an Erasmus student, that's where I met my wife. Good things do come out of these things, um, but we might have Turing couples in the future. Thank you very much for your participation as well, uh, um, for your time, and have a good weekend, sir. Uh, Quentin, what's your prediction? Uh, I think that as a journalist and uh, analyst and a scholar, you could be very frank and uh, uh, open, and you could uh, try to predict some things. Well, I think that the first job for the coming year is to try and restore trust. Um, I think that the negotiating process of Brexit, indeed the entire process of Brexit since the referendum vote, has been very poisonous to our relations between the UK and its now former partners. Uh, and a great deal has to be done to try and restore that trust. It's not yet happening. What I mentioned about this stupid business about not giving diplomatic recognition to the EU ambassador is an example of the silly way in which we're continuing to sort of shout at each other and not get down and make sense of, of, of uh, our future relations and, and really working together. There are some good things going to happen this year, I hope. Uh, the, because Britain has got the chair of the Group of Seven, the G7, and the co-chair with Italy of the uh, COP26 negotiations on climate change, there's a real possibility for the Brits to show that they are really positively engaged in international relations. I think that's very important. Inevitably, dealing with the pandemic is going to be the overwhelming subject, though. And on that, we need to cooperate. And we also need to conduct, we were talking about immigration just now, we need to actually have quite an open door on immigration, because our National Health Service depends on having immigrants, our care services depend on having immigrants, and producing fruit in the countryside uh, depends on having immigrants, almost all of them overwhelmingly from the European Union. So I think we're going to have to go back on some of those things and actually open our doors to European Union migration, where we've said we were going to close them. I'm not so sure that Mr. Johnson and, and his ministers are on the same uh, track as you. Uh, could we expect that the post-Brexit time and this year might be kind of burden for, for his government as well on the internal politics uh, scene? And what other uh, uh, events we might expect in Scotland or Ireland, Northern Ireland uh, in 2021? Well, we're going to see, I think, a very large um, Scottish National Party majority coming out of the elections in Scotland this year. I expect Ambassador Dalgleish, with his wonderful Scottish name, knows even more about that than I do. Um, but uh, inevitably, that's going to be an issue. And Northern Ireland is going to be a very difficult and sensitive issue to deal with. So if actually, Boris Johnson, who presents himself as a unionist in the United Kingdom, has so far done probably more the poison relations within the United Kingdom, he's going to have to work very hard to hold the country together. Quentin, one more time, thank you very much for uh, your time and participation in this Zoom session. And uh, finally, we go to sunny Italy. Uh, is it sunny these days uh, in Italy here in Zagreb? It's uh, foggy and a nippy day. Uh, Lucia, your uh, final closure words, you know, from your perspective, living in Italy now, how does that look like? Um, year of post-Brexit uh, crisis or opportunities? Perhaps I would feel more comfortable about, about making prediction on financial services uh, parts. And I would say uh, two things uh, will happen. The first one, there will be a, a, a continuous uh, a drifting away, a gradual of some financial entities and activities from the UK 
to the European Union, of course, London will remain a leading international financial center. So that will be something gradual. And the second one, I also would expect a, 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 an ongoing set of negotiations between the UK and the European Union concerning financial services, equivalence, uh, access, and so on. So uh, Brexit negotiations are not over yet, at least for, for the financial part. Thank you very much uh, to you as well and uh, have a nice weekend. Uh, thank you for uh, your time and patience and interest. Uh, this was a Zoom event, uh, uh, Europe after Brexit, UK after EU, organized by uh, the European Parliament. We have an office uh, here in Zagreb. Have a nice time and see you very soon, I hope.